We have only a couple weeks left of Kashrut. Tonight we're going to cover several items. Some of them are in the back. You can't see them. This one actually, all these points pertain to the same thing. Hala, Afrashat Hala. It's also part of Kashrut because it pertains to something which is forbidden for us to eat. Something that has to be removed. It is comparable to Teruma during the days that we had a Betta Migdasha temple and Trumot and Maasrot were removed from certain foods, so was Hala. So even though Midoraita, it only applies under certain conditions, for example, in Eretz Israel and with all the Jews being there, nevertheless today it's applicable at least in Rabbanan in Eretz Israel and in Husla it's in the Brest Supreme, it's also by rabbinic decree only because the rabbis did not want Shalot Yishtakach Torat Halam in Israel. But this whole custom, this beautiful custom, as you will soon see why it's so special, of removing challah when uh, baking, because it's so important, because it, it's very meaningful, in order for it not to be forgotten, they said it still applies today, even in Chutzlai. So today, in, in anywhere in the world, uh, depending on what you're baking and how much you're preparing, one may need to be aware of this uh, important mitzvah. So that is why we're going to discuss the various details that pertain to it. The mitzvah the rabbis tell us belongs to a woman at first. Even a man can do it if he's the one that bakes at home. But the mitzvah belongs to a woman, much more than to a man. Anybody know why? It has to do with the chet of Adam Arishon. Chava was involved in the first uh, sin, right? In not following God's instructions. And because she disturbed the whole plan, the original blueprint that God had in mind, and she interfered with uh, with the goal, with the goals that were originally set, which were for man to be in a particular state. And Adam, man, is considered the hala of the olam, the hala of the world. In other words, the most important part, the Nezer Habriya, the crown of creation. So she is the one that, that in order to fix that, the damage that she did, uh, she removes the hala from the isa, from the dough. There are other explanations given too, but that is approximately the idea that she is involved in lighting candles as well. She extinguished the light of the world, also uh, relating to Adam Arishon, who was the light. So she gets involved in those uh, commandments. So even though today it's only by rabbinic decree, it's only a custom in Chutzlai, she's the one that should have first uh, say. If she wants to perform the mitzvah, the husband is not allowed to take away from her that opportunity, that mitzvah. Even if he says, you know, I want to do it. No, it's her. If she's not around or if he's single, then of course he can perform it. Yeah? No, no, for anybody. For any woman, married or single. We're going to talk about all of this. That's all these details. We're going to talk about the various details of, uh, of this mitzvah. So first of all, one needs to know that uh, this mitzvah applies to Hameshet Midetagan, to the five grains. Chita, Seura, Kusemet, Shifon, Veshibole, Shual, Wheat, Barley, Belt, oat, and rye, the five types of grain. I'm not sure if I said it in the correct order when I translated it, but these are the five grains. In other words, if you make something out of rice, you would not have to remove challah. And I'll tell you what, what I mean by removing challah as soon as we get to, to the actual procedure, the actual steps. But what we need to know right now is that if you're going to be baking bread, for example, it needs to be from one of the five grains. If it's anything else, then it's exempt. However, if you have mixtures, then of course, if you can taste the five, the, one of the grains, then it would require this mitzvah too. When do you take challah? At the time, ideally, at the time when you are kneading it, when you're mixing the, the flour in the water. Not when it's in flour form. When it, become, when it begins to become a dough, one piece. Because when it's not a dough, it's all like powder, right? The flour, it's not one. The mitzvah is ideally take, done at the time when it's all one piece, and that is the time that the, the flour comes in contact with the water and it becomes what is called an isa in Hebrew, or a dough, or what we call the, the process of kneading. That is the ideal time when after you've done the kneading, you remove a piece. How much? Kezai, a small piece. It doesn't have to be a large amount. It shouldn't be too much because as you're going to see later on, we're going to burn it anyway. Take a small piece. And that is called the hafrasha of the hala, which is like a hafrasha of teruma. It, it had certain kedusha, especially during the time of the Beit Hamikdash, when it was an obligation, when it was a mitzvah de oraita. It was even more significant then. You know, we could not eat it. It belonged to the kohen. 
Today, because it's only either Midrabanan or Midivre Supreme, it's only a custom, and one cannot uh, give it to Kohen because there's no eating today with Tahara, with complete cleanliness, that hala that is going to be removed is going to be burned on the fire. You're going to take that piece that you removed, and you're going to put it somewhere on the burner, and you're going to burn it until it's not uh, totally unedible. Then you can do whatever you throw it away. That is the process of Afrashat Hala. Now let's say you forgot. Let's say you forgot to take Hala at the right time during the kneading process. You can still do it afterwards. After the, ba- the bread was baked, you take it out of the oven, it's not too late. You can still remove the Hala by taking a piece of one of the breads and, uh, and burning it. So the same would apply then. It's not too late. The problem begins uh, on Shabbat. On Shabbat, you cannot make any tikkunim. And we'll be speaking a little bit about that next week when we speak about tevilat kelim and hagalat kelim. If you forgot to take a cleave to the mikveh, certain kelim need to be immersed in the mikveh before you use them. You cannot make that tikkun, that immersion on Shabbat. It's a form of tikkun, of repair, of fixing. The same thing with the afrasha of tumot and maasrot, the afrasha of chala, the removal of the, of the certain uh, priestly gifts. I guess I, 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 we can call them the Tumot and Ma'asrot they need to be removed before Shabbat otherwise if you do, were to do it on Shabbat you're fixing, you cannot do that on Shabbat so it becomes a problem especially in Eretz Israel, where it's Midr Abanan which is it's a lot stricter than here in Chutzlaret you're in trouble if you did not remove challah and you bake bread you just may not be able to eat it there are still ways perhaps that it could be done but it's not easy you may have to borrow bread if somebody did not remove the halal before Shabbat, it cannot be done on Shabbat easily. In Chutz Laaretz, there's one important distinction. Because it's only Medivre Sokrim, it's slightly not as strict as in Eretz Israel. If one forgot to take halal before Shabbat, all he needs to do is leave over a little bit of what he eats. So he can eat the halal and just leave over. And what remains, that will be designated as halal. You take care of it, of course, after Shabbat, you will burn it. That leaving over, which is called shiur, the shayer, is only mutam in chutzpah, is to leave over. One would not be able to do that in a chutz in Eretz Israel. You cannot leave over. You would have, before you can eat, the chala has to be removed. But up until the baking process, if it's before Shabbat, if one forgot to do it during this ideal time, during, during the kneading process, you can do it later on too. You know, you already put it into the oven, it's already baked, the chala came out fine, you can do it then. But the real time to do it is the man halisha during the time one is kneading the dough, and of course, if, he's, if, if he's, you're baking the what Shabbat, you know, nobody bakes on Shabbat. I hope, right? Everybody is preparing everything, and if one remembers that that is the time to do it, then he's not going to have a problem doing it later. He's going to do it hopefully on time and not forget. Okay, so when do we make this? When we when do we perform this mitzvah? Most of you probably have not seen your mothers take challah all the time when they've made a bread perhaps, or a cake, or cookies. you know what the reason for that is? Quantity. quantity. There needs to be a certain quantity. Besides the five grains, it has to be, well, from one of the five grains, there has to be a certain quantity. If that quantity is not there, then it's patur mechala. That particular dough, that, that dough that is being prepared for whatever purpose, is that it's going to be exempt. How much is that amount? There are several opinions that hold that... I guess I didn't write it over here. I'll tell you by heart. There are several things that hold that it's close to 5 pounds. 2.2 kilograms. Some say it's closer to 3 and 2 thirds pounds. Not kilograms. Pounds. Okay? In other words, 1.666 kilos. Approximately. Regardless, we follow the opinion that for a blessing to be made on the hafrasha one should have approximately 4.95, about a 5-pound bag. If you're going to use a 5-pound bag of flour, and they sell 5-pound bags, you're going to use an entire bag to make uh, bread, challah, then you're going to perform this mitzvah with a beracha, with a blessing. The question arises if you're going to make a smaller amount. So if that amount is going to be closer to 3 and 2 thirds of a pound, a lot of people have the custom to just remove the challah. Well, without a beracha, Nothing can happen, nothing is wrong with that. You can always remove, and it's nice anyway. So it's a good thing to get into the habit of performing this mitzvah. Some people have this custom of baking the Chvot Shabbat just so, so they can perform this mitzvah of a Hashat Chala. 
So it's something that I encourage all women to learn, uh, to do, to bake halot, before Shabbat, or whatever, just for the sake of performing this mitzvah, which is a very special mitzvah, even though today it's only with Rabbanan. Some say at least once a year one should perform this mitzvah. And it's not too difficult either. So if you have the correct amount, there's going to be a beracha being said. If the amount is not there, but it's at least about three and two-thirds of a pound, then you can definitely remove halat, but not make the blessing. <coughs> now, what's also important to note is what's the purpose of this dough? What are you making? If you're going to be making ba- a cake, is that the same as bread? <coughs> Even though cake is mezonot, if that cake batter, I think they call it in English, right? That mixture contains water. So technically, that can be used to make bread. You're just making it sweet. You're adding eggs and sugar, and probably vanilla extract, etc., right? To make the cake. So because this batter can technically become bread, even though you're making cake, because of its composition, it requires hafrashat challah as well. Some people are unaware of that, right? Yes, you would still say the berachah. Now, the reason why most people do not take halal when they make cake is not because it's cake, because usually most people don't use a five-pound bag to make cake. That's the only reason. But if you were to use the entire five-pound bag to make a whole bunch of cakes, right, <coughs> then that entire dough, as long as it's, it's in one place, and I'll talk about that soon, as long as that entire dough is in one place, the dough, that five-pound dough, then you would remove hala with a beracha. <coughs> La- yeah, there's two versions, whether it's a private or Ashkenazi. Whether it's lafrish hala min aisa, lafrish hala teruma, and after you remove the hala, some have the custom of saying zu hala. No. Lafrish hala min aisa is Ashkenazi. Lafrish <coughs> hala teruma. Just check your sidur, you know, whichever. It's all, it's all, it's all the same. <coughs> As I said uh, before, with cake, you very rarely are going to come across this because I don't think anybody's going to make that much uh, cake. But if you do, if you make a big batter, you have a large amount of, uh, of, uh, of the kemah, at least five pounds, and you need it, right? You make the dough, and it's all in one place, then you're going to take halat from that dough, from that batter. But yeah. The right, I'm going to talk about that. That's called siru. We'll talk about that soon. In other words, what happens if you're making small amounts here and there, and each one is less than five pounds, but all together, they become five pounds. We'll leave that towards the end. What if you're making sufganyot? <coughs> sufganyot, and everybody know here what sufganyot is? You're not baking it in the oven, you're frying it. I just use sufganyot as an example. There are many uh, <coughs> recipes that you could make with dough that is fried and not baked. That is exempt. From challah. If it's not going to be baked, if you're going to make it, you're going to fry it in oil, right? then it's not, that, that's not called bread. It's, that does not even resemble bread, and because of that, it does not require a prashat challah. So as long as you intend to make a form of bread, or the batter contains the ingredients, which technically can, be, can make it become a bread, and you have the amount of five pounds, that would require a prashat challah with the beracha. If it's less, if it's three and two thirds, you, you should still take the halal off and not make the beracha in that case. As I said before, the mitzvah belongs to the isha. Ideally, <coughs> she should she should be the one performing it, and she should remember to make the blessing if the blessing is required. <coughs> now let's talk about the last item, siruf. Siruf asal, I call it. Let's say you started making different things and you bake them at, the, at different times. You did not remove the, or for example, you did not remove the challah at the real time, during the time that you were making the dough. You remove the challah later on, right? After it's been baked. However, what you've done is bake small halot. You've made cake, you've made halot, you've made small amounts, and each one is less than the shi'ur. Maybe perhaps you did it at different intervals, different times. So there's something called siru fasal. If you're going to put them all in one basket, if they're all coming together at some point after baking, and they're in one place, and that sal, that basket contains the required amount, that's hayat bechala, we have rashat chala as well. So if at some point they come together in a basket, all together, then even though you've made them separately, and each one, each dough, 
was less. There was no five pounds in, the, in each piece. Nevertheless, because they come together at some point in a cell, in a basket, not just on a table or on a counter, that would require hafashat halal as well with the beracha. So otherwise, there are many situations where one may not need to take halal. He's making small amounts, right? It's very, you know, unusual for somebody to use the entire five pounds to make just one big cake or one big halal. Unless you maybe you're in a bakery. And by the way, they need to do it too. They are, they have to do it. Sure. Sure. No, because hopefully, you know, with Jewish bread, everything was performed. Okay? If it was not, then you would take out a piece, if you suspect, and you would burn it. You would not make a better half because it's a suffix. Yeah, but you don't do it unless you know or you suspect that it hasn't been done. Yeah. So, if you're going to be baking small amounts, but eventually they're going to be coming together in one basket, even though they're smaller than the five pounds, but because altogether they do contain the five pounds, you would perform the mitzvah and you would make the beracha. Okay, so this is a, a very important mitzvah that, that women should get used to, especially the Lefot Shabbat. But even for a man, you know, if a woman is not around or is single, it's a good thing to do. It's a, a very special mitzvah. Yeah. Well, you don't have to eat all of it at one time. You put it, you put it in the freezer. You just make the batter, right? You bake. A lot of people, you know, bake and put away for two, three weeks. You don't have to do it every week, no. Yeah. You got a little bit erased there, but I think most of you could see it, right? Okay. Real briefly, there's something called matnot kehuna that I don't think any of you will ever have to deal with unless you own uh, animals. Matnot Keuna are various priestly gifts that belong to the Kohen, just like Rumot and Masot, and just like Hala. Hala, however, is not given to the Kohen today, it's burnt. But there is something called Matnot Keuna that could apply even today. And that is that when you slaughter an animal, there are certain parts that belong to the Kohen. The forelimb, which is the, on the right side, the forelimb, not the back leg, but the forelimb, parts of it, plus the cheeks, in the stomach, you would remove and give that to the Kohen. So that's uh, something that uh, I don't think most of you will come across, but those do not belong to us. You might think I'm cutting the whole animal belongs to me. Those will belong to a Kohen. There's, there's a discussion if today it's Midoraita or Midorabanan, but uh, regardless of where you are in the world, those will belong to the Kohen. It's a little bit more lenient with, than with other gifts like Truma. It doesn't have the same holiness. You can give it to a woman who's a bad Kohen even though she's married to an Israel. If you don't have a Kohen, you could exchange it with money, eat it yourself and give the money to a Kohen. So these three parts that I said, the forelimb, the cheeks, the two cheeks, uh, and which includes part of the tongue as well, uh, and the stomach would be given as gifts to the Kohen. So those are a sur for us to eat. That's again, something that you don't come across, but just for you to remember this is also part of Ilkhot Kashrut. It's something that we are not allowed to eat. Unless he gives it back to us. It sounds like karuma that you cannot eat, even if, even if you were to give it to you. All right, the next mitzvah. Very important mitzvah that people are becoming more and more acquainted with nowadays. And that is the mitzvah of hadash. Tua hadasha. The new crop, the new wheat. I put a little calendar here. Got it ready. But what you see here is the month of Nisan from the 10th and so the 24th. But it could be from the beginning of the month too. I'm just using this as an example. It's important for us to note when the wheat was nishrash, when it took root in the ground. Any wheat that was sown, that took root in the ground already, not just sown, but took root, before the 16th day of Nisan, which traditionally is when they brought the Omer, during the time of the Beit HaMikdash, which was like a, a time to celebrate the new crop, it was a ritual. For any crop or any seed, wheat, barley, whatever, that took root in the ground before the 16th, when it becomes time, it ripens, and you can harvest it, you can eat it any time later. If it did not take root until after the design of Nisan, until after the 16th of Nisan, it took root sometime on the 21st of Nisan. Right? You plant it, it takes time to make root. It only made root sometime later in the month of Nisan. That's called Hadash. And that, that wheat cannot be eaten. You cannot buy flour 
made that wheat and bake it and eat from it until the next year, until the next honor. So if it's before this, I'm going to I'm going to explain. So if it's before this day, it made good. It's called yashan. If it's after this day, it's called hadash. You can eat it eventually, but not right away. You have to wait until this year, day comes back around next year, <coughs> uh, the 16th day of Nisan. Now, so what happens is, there are various discussions and opinions of whether this applies today, as it did in the past, as with the other mitzvot. Uh, the, most, the majority of the rabbis are strict, are of the opinion that this applies today too, at least with the Rabbanan. Whether it's in Chutzlaris or in Israel, whether the wheat belongs to you or to a goy, the, the, the dinim would apply. Uh, so what do we do today? Can you just go to a bakery, can you, or not to a bakery, to a supermarket and buy any flour? Maybe that flour is hadash. They just harvested. What? Oh, good question. That is one of the reasons why we are allowed, according to some opinions, there is a leniency. Since we do not know, there is several doubts here whether it's from last year, and even if it's not from last year, even if it's from this year's crop, maybe it took root before the 16th day of Nisan. So there's various sefikot here. Because there are various sefikot, various doubts, there's a leniency that some opinions allow us to, to as a result of this leniency, to eat anything that we, any uh, flower that we see, by assuming that there's a good chance that it's yashan. However, today, some opinions hold that because one can determine the date Everything today is so well organized with the stamps on the, on, the, on the sack of wheat or of the flour or when it was produced, when it was harvested perhaps, because it may be possible to find out that we no longer have that leniency. So you are seeing more and more people today in America who are aware of this Hadash problem asking bakers to purchase only Yashan and not Hadash. So if you ever come across this question and you hear the word Yashan, Hadash, just remember, it has to do with the wheat and when it took made root in the ground. If it made root prior to the 16th day of Nisan, a few days before, a couple of days, whatever it was, then as soon as it becomes ready, later in Nisan, in the Yad and Sivan, you can harvest it and you can eat it. You can make whiskey from it. But if it did not take root until later, after the 16th day of Nisan, you have to wait till the next Omer, because it's called Hadash, Tvoa Hadasha, Sherak HaOmer Matir. Only the Omer will permit it for us to consume. So in Eretz Israel, of course, this is an issue that there's no question about it. You know, people have to be careful. In the Chutzma because of the circumstances, because of the various doubts that we have, there is, there are authorities, our opinions that hold that there's a leniency that we can rely on. And we have been relying on that leniency for many, many generations. You can't really tell, right. So, yeah. But if, for example, you go to a kosher bakery, supposedly they can get hold of Yashan and Hadas, so why shouldn't they get Yashan for you? If they say they could get it. It's possible for them to get something which is, they know for sure is Yashan. Now when they say Yashan, it doesn't mean that it's very, very old and stale. It just means that it complies with this, depending on what time of the year you're in. Most bakeries, the bakeries in town don't comply with it? They have not complied with it until recently. Recently, in the past year or two, because of demand, they said, okay, you want it? We'll try to get it for you. You know, once one bakery begins to do it, the other bakers try to follow, to compete. Not necessary. Not necessary. So, today, you may have some bakeries that may have a combination. They'll tell you the, the cakes are not, we don't know what they are. Nobody will tell you for sure this is Hadash, because if, if they know it's Hadash, it's a sur. If they were to know which, that this crop is Hadash, it's a sur. But we, because we do not know, there is reason to assume that it could be Yashan and permissible in whose status. Yes. The to, that's, the to, that's the commandment in the Torah. Yeah, it's one of the commandments in the Torah. So this also belongs to Kashrut. It's something that we don't uh, recognize because we haven't dealt with it. We haven't dealt with, dealt with it directly here in Chutz Laaretz because of the leniency that we assume there's a good chance that this is Yashan. Yeah. yeah. Depending on what time of the year you're holding, right? If it's very close to the Omer, then right. Then there's no problem because if you're holding, if you're standing right after the Omer, right? Sometimes in the sun, I mean, the wheat takes a while for it to go and to be harvested, so it has to be a sun. 
They had to all from last year even. The question is when you're already in the middle of the year, let's say you're in January, February, depending on when they harvest the crop. So it would depend on the crop itself, depending on what you're dealing with. So obviously if you are familiar with the crop, you know when they when they when it takes root, when they see the ground, when they harvest it, you may become aware of whether this is Hadash Yashan. So he, you are right. It could be that today, because things are, are much uh, better organized and, 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 and are known, and they perhaps make efforts to use, you know, use the wheat quickly, to not to use old wheat perhaps, perhaps they have different standards, you know. Uh, it could be that they would not wait for, or allow it to sit in the ground too long. That's very possible, depending on the country. But there has been a leniency uh, in Chutzmaris that many are, many have relied on. And as long as you do not know that this is Hadash, it's very possible that it's Yashan. It is, well, I'm not going to say very possible, there's a possibility it is Yashan, depending on what time of the year. But as I said before, people have uh, requested this. And if it is possible, by the way, to obtain Yashan, the one should definitely make the effort to purchase Yashan. Halada was made. Okay, the last item that we're going to be doing in Kashrut is Chametz. Because next week, what we have left is Tvilat Kelim, Hagalat Kelim, and how to make a kitchen, a kitchen kosher. You come to a hotel, and you're going to be spending there several weeks, and you want to use the oven, you want to use the microwave, you want to use the stove. How do you make a kosher? Or you, you just moved into an apartment. The landlord gave you a stove and oven and it's not kosher and he's not going to buy you a new one. How do you make a kosher? And hagalat kelim and tvilat kelim, how to make your vessels, your frying pans and pots kosher. All of that will cover next week. And after that, I don't think we'll manage next week, but perhaps the week after that, we'll cover the various supervisions in the market, uh, which ones are reliable and which ones are suspect, and what ingredients to look out for. If you see something like monasterets, right, what does it mean? If there's no supervision on it, can you just eat it without any supervision? And what do you do about restaurants altogether? Uh, vegetarian restaurants that are not kosher. Could you ever eat in one if you're a traveler? So all of these items I'll cover the last week of Kashrut. So today we're, we're finishing, uh, perhaps, uh, I, think, I think I can call it finishing, the last item that uh, uh, poses problems in Kashrut as far as consumption is concerned. We cannot consume hametz, unless it's a form of prohibited food, but only for seven or eight days of the year. That's the only difference between hametz and everything else. You can never eat tolaim, you can never eat insects, right? Insects are always forbidden, right? Nevelot, utrefot, right? Hala, hadash, and so forth. But hametz is a unique isur that only applies once a year for a period of seven days in Eretz Israel and eight days in Kuzlare. So I'm not going to go into all the halachot of Pesach, but just going to give you an overview, quick overview, of what's involved. Hametz is something unique, as you know there, what's, what happens when food, not, not just food, but uh, wheat or any of the grains comes in contact with water, there is a process of uh, fermentation, there's something called leavening, right? That's what makes the, this food hametz, or there's a process of himutz. The Torah forbids chametz or any food that contains chametz on Pesach. <coughs> now chametz is very unique because the rabbis tell us that it's a surah filu b'masho. We talked about earlier on that there is a concept called bitul. That even if something is not kosher, it can become annulled or canceled if it's mixed with other food items. We talked about batel berov, batel bishishim. Something can be annulled or canceled if there is a majority or if there is 60. For example, a drop of milk falling into a pot of goulash, meat, right? If it's only, if there's 60 or, or more quantities uh, of the meat or water against the drop of milk, then it's batel, it is as though it does not exist. You can eat the whole thing. <coughs> Hametz, we are much stricter. And the way you notice how strict we are in Pesach is because our forefathers, our mothers, and grandmothers especially, worked so very, worked so hard to clean the house. And you wonder, why are you working so hard? Why do you clean the walls? I don't know if you've seen this happen in, in your time, but in the past, they clean walls, they clean everything. Why do they work so hard? Because Hametz is a sur de mashu, even a little bit. And <coughs> there is an isur of bal yira'en, bal yimatzeh. Very unique isur that not only cannot, can you not have it, 
you cannot eat it, you cannot have it in your possession, you cannot see it. Obviously, you can see Hamet, that it's not yours. But Bali Ra'e, Bali Matse means that it cannot be found in your possession. Even if it's in some other house, but belongs to you, that's also called your possession. So you cannot have it in your home, you cannot own it, <coughs> you cannot benefit from it. So Hamet is unique, and because of the various prohibitions, and because it's so strict that the Torah says whoever eats it is Hayab Karet, the rabbis went, like, the, like we said, the extra mile and said, it's a surah filu b'mashahu, even a little bit, even if it gets mixed, it's not necessarily batel, depending on the circumstances. So that is why so much cleaning and so much preparation goes into Pesach. So let's briefly go over the various steps that are required to get rid of this hametz. They are bedika, bitul, biur, and nechira. We clean our homes, and the night before Pesach, there's something called bedika. We search our homes. We search, make sure that, that there's no hametz left over. That bedika, by the way, is done after you've already vacuumed your home, after you've done a good cleaning. That bedika is just to a certain that there's nothing left over. Why? Because rabbis were concerned if you don't make the bedika, it may happen that you, the child took a cookie into one of his, I don't know, to one of the bedrooms and uh, left it there. You forgot about it. And you should never allow kids, by the way, to take in food into their bedrooms. It just makes life more difficult for us. And... Uh, if you did not make a good bedika, you may find it in Pesach, and you may, you may come to eat from it. And that's a good, uh, that's a very serious uh, isur. Another reason they told us to make bedika is because of the following concept called bitul. Bitul means to annul. If somebody has chametz on pe- uh, in his home, but he's not, he's not sure where it is. He forgot about it. He's not aware that he has it. It will be a problem because of bali ra'im, bali matzeh. You're, you're not allowed to have it in your possession. So the rabbis tell us that. If you make bitul, which is a, it's a nusach that one says, it's a paragraph that one says, in whatever language you understand, that any hametz that I am not aware of, that I have in my possession, ani mafkir, ani I, it does not belong to me, I give it away. It is like the dust of the earth. That removes his responsibility of having any hametz in Pesach. That is sufficient. But because you have bitul, then why do we... Why, why would one need bedika? In other words, if, if bitul takes care of all one's problems, why does one need bedika? So one of the reasons I gave you was because you may find something, you may come to eat it. The second reason is the rabbis felt that a person may not fully and sincerely express the bitul. He may have hametz in his house and he doesn't want to get rid of it. Lots of it, expensive hametz. And he may not make the bitul sincerely. So he said, you know what, we're going to ask you to make the bedika to make sure you have nothing. So to help you uh, have the proper kavanah and to express sincerely that you don't want to have anything to do with it. The problem arises when you know for sure you have something and you have very expensive and you can't get rid of it. Then what do you do? That takes us to mechira, and I'll come back to Bior in a moment. You're allowed to sell it. Now if you have real hametz, like bread, a loaf of bread, don't sell it. Make sure you don't buy too much before Pesach, so that you finish it. But some people may think, oh, okay, it's okay if I have a little left over, I'll just put it away in the freezer and I'll sell my freezer. No. Ideally, the rabbi said, one should not sell real hametz. There's problems with that. If you have real hametz before Pesach, give it to the maid. Try to finish it if you can. Or give it back to the store. They'll take it back. If you didn't open the package, you have cereal, give it back. You bought too much. Don't... Have, you're not, we're not allowed to have it in our possession. And ideally, one should not sell hametz mamash to a goy. So even though we perform the bitul, there might be uh, a certain amount of alcoholic beverages that might be considered hametz that are too expensive for us to get rid of to finish. So the rabbi said, if it's not hametz gamur, hametz mamash, you can sell it. But if it's real, real hametz, you know, spaghetti you know, or uh, cereal or bread, just uh, give it to the maid, especially if it's small amounts that you, you know. You don't want to throw away large amounts because that's about the shape. You're not out of the store food just like that. Throw it away in the garbage. Give it to the maid. Give it to a goy. Ideally, we don't want to sell. If one has no choice, he has a whole shot. That is what the mikhira was intended for, for people like that. Somebody want to ask something? Yeah. Right. Right. So. Sure. Kriknes is just an agent for you that sells it to a goy. They do the, they do it for you. Instead of you going directly to a goy, 
the defense gathers everybody's signatures and permission, and they have a, a designated goy, which they do business with. Then we have the Bi'ur Hametz, the burning of the Hametz that is done also the day before Pesach, right? And uh, which is not necessarily something that you have to do if you don't have any Hametz left over. Some say you should nevertheless do it. That happens the day before Pesach. One actually takes whatever little Hametz that he had, that he found during the Bidika, or that he had left over, and he burns it before Pesach. These are the various steps that one takes before Pesach. If one did not do so, remove the Pesach from his possession, not only does he have the Avon of having in his possession of Hametz and Pesach, but he cannot benefit from it after Pesach. There is a penalty. You cannot use Hametz Shavar al Pesach. That is why when we go to purchase Hametz right after Pesach, we want to buy uh, cereals and, and bread. We want to make sure that the person we're buying from, if he's Jewish, sold his Hametz or did what was required of him. Otherwise, we can't buy it until at least perhaps 30 days went by because we figure 30 days is the amount of time required for people to have a new shipment, depending on the shop or the supermarket. So if you know that this grocer, this uh, store is Jewish, you want to make sure that he sold his hummus, we have to ask him. And don't just ask him if you sell your hummus, who sold it for you? No, you don't trust him. Because if nobody sold his hummus, we cannot buy his hummus. The Sul Bahana can benefit from it. Yes. Hello. Right? You can, so you can have Pakosha for Passover food on the airplane. They may have it. I don't know. Have, yeah. No, that's okay. You, know, you just clean your your table or wherever you're sitting, and uh, you bring your own food. What? Right. If it's not yours, you don't own it. It's okay if it's in the same room as you. Yeah, that's not a problem. Okay. Uh, tarovet hametz is a soup just like hametz itself. Tarovet means mixtures. You have ingredients that are hametz. It doesn't have to be that the whole product is hametz. Even if they're hametz ingredients, that would render the food hametz. And therefore, when we go shopping for products, Mozarim I wrote here, uh, one has to be uh, very, very careful, much uh, more uh, conscientious about what he's buying because uh, during the year, there are various leniencies. As I said before, there's 60 amounts against it. Uh, there's just a variety of leniencies when it comes to uh, uh, certain ingredients, whether they're acceptable or not. Pesach were stricter, and therefore we require strict supervision, making sure that the machines were not used for hametz either, even though this product is kosher for Passover. It has, it has to have been used in the machine uh, that was cleansed for Passover as well, or that they did not use uh, food items that are hametz. So we make sure, unless it's pure water, you know, there's almost anything can have problems. Even orange just requires kashel pesach for another reason, something called kitniyot, which I'll get to in a moment. So when you're buying food for pesach, you have to be even more careful than the rest of the year. Something which is not raula filat keler, something which is not edible, like certain medications, capsules, which spoke about the problem of gelatin that they make capsules from. The reason why these uh, items could be okay in pa- Passover, even though uh, there's some ingredient in the capsule that is made from starch from a hamet is because it's not raula filat kelet, either it's not edible for human consumption, for an, even for animal consumption, which is better. If something is ed- it's not edible for man, for human consumption, but it's edible for dogs, for animals, it's not, it's not uh, as good, but it's not bad either. It's better than, than being edible. But if something's not even edible, la filat kelet, as an example, shoe polish, it may have alcohol, and alcohol could be derived from hamets, unless it's synthetic, right? Vinegar. You have wine vinegar. You have uh, other vinegars, which is hametz. So if it's if it's something which is not edible, like shoe polish, shampoo, and soaps, which may have ingredients that are hametz, very possible. But because it's not edible, achilat kelev, it will be permissible. So certain medicines may be okay, and some are not, especially the ones that are in liquid form. People who need to take medication need to consult a rabbi, perhaps on on some alternative on how to take this medication that has hametz, nevertheless. How, how do they do it? There are, there are ways to, to take medication. But if it's not in liquid form, if it's, if it's some sort of capsule, which is not raula filat kelet, it's not the... Uh, or, it, or there's another term. It's taking shalok ederech achila. You don't actually eat and chew it. It's swallowed. That is also permissible on Pesach. 
and a whole year round, even if it has some ingredient which is not kosher or if it's not All right, we have kitniyot. Anybody remember what kitniyot is? If you're a Sephardic, you don't have to be concerned with it, only for Ashkenazim. There is a custom amongst uh, certain communities of, of Europe that legumes, the various types of beans, peas, corn, sesame, mustard, uh, right? What's called legumes is not to be eaten in Pesach. Why? Because they resemble, many of them would, re- would resemble kernels of wheat. And in, many, and in many places, perhaps, they were packaged together or they came in close contact with each other. So because of what I said before, the Pesach were strict. Afilu Bemashu, Hametz Tzu, Afilu Bemashu, even just a little bit, we were extra careful Then those communities, they said, you know, for the seven, eight days, we can, uh, we can stay back. Rice. So, Sparadim eat rice, except for Moroccans, I believe. Uh, they eat lentils, right? But they don't eat hummus. Right? Because it sounds like hametz. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, all the types of shell we eat, also not. Right? Afuna, exactly. Right? So all of this is called legumes or kitniyot. There are some that allow derivatives of kitniyot. For example, the various oils. Right? So you, you may find that some Ashkenazim will not have corn oil for Pesach. Some yes, some not. Because it's corn. Right? And they would use cottonseed oil, walnut oil. Anything which is not kitniyot. So if you ever wonder what this is, that's what this is. Because of their of that custom that existed in Europe, uh, they stayed away from certain food items that would be problematic. This one I think none of you have heard of, because even amongst Ashkenazim, gebro, that's a Yiddish word. Gebro. Yeah. Now the reason I'm mentioning it here is in case you, you are invited to somebody's home and he says, do you eat gebro? What's that? The only Ashkenazim would know it because amongst them there are some that eat kibroch and some that do not eat kibroch. What this is, is matzah meal with water. <coughs> you know, there are certain things that you could make with matzah meal and water. You can make little cakes. <coughs> but the problem is, it's because this is matzah meal, right, that this comes originally from matzah, this may have originally, this was originally flour, and it may not have been baked well, so it could be part of it were not baked well, as soon as they come in contact with water, they could become hametz. Even though this is a remote, what did we say before? In Pesach, everybody was very careful. So some were careful even with Gibroff, that because there's a possibility that this parts of the matzah or the matzah meal were not fully baked, they don't even soak it in water, in the soup, the matzah. They don't use it with water. Some nevertheless would use it with, with the oil or with the eggs, but not with water. However, that brings us to another problem called Mei Perot. Mei Perot, there's a discussion of whether it could be Mahmitz or not, whether that can bring about a certain degree of Himus, can it, can it make something Hamez, because for, as far as we know, it does not act like water. Orange juice does not act like water in performing the Himus, in making the, the, the flower Hamez. Some say on the contrary, it makes the Hamez a lot quicker than water. And many agree that if there was water afterwards, after the after the meiterot, then it would for sure become a problem. That it would become hametz. If you first use the juices and then you introduced water, then it could for sure become a problem. So meiterot uh, is something which Sephardim are for sure not makpid. There's no problem with it. Not only that, you could have egg matzah. What's egg matzah? It's not made with water. It's made with apple juice made with eggs, there's no problem. However, Ashkenazim are much more mah, uh, mahmir, they are much stricter, they do not eat egg matzah and Pesach. This is a bigger problem than the Gibrochs, because this one, there are some opinions who hold that the, this other mixtures of juices can be a serious problem for the flour too. So unless you took the mixture and you immediately baked it, you didn't wait too long, right? Even with regular matzah, we make sure we don't wait too much time, otherwise it becomes hametz. You have to bake it immediately. So unless you took that mixture with eggs or with apple juice and immediately baked it, you could run into trouble. So Ashkenazim don't eat egg matzah, except for the elderly, the ones that they're, you know, do not have teeth, you know, they have a hard time chewing, and this is a softer matzah. So we allow them to soak their matzah, we allow them to eat the egg matzah, or for kids, they can't bite on that hard matzah shmura or even square matzah. It might be 
too hard for them. They can't digest it easily. We allow them to have the egg matzah, but not for adults. Especially for the seder night. For the seder night, you want to real, you want to eat the real McCoy, right? The real thing. And egg matzah is not the real thing. Egg matzah is just uh, you know, an imitation of the real thing. With, with some of them are even chocolate covered. You know? That's not real matzah. So for somebody who cannot eat and digest or chew well the matzah, we allow him to have the egg matzah that was made with may perot. Otherwise, for regular adults, we do not allow it. Again, that's for Ashkenazim. For Sephardim, there's no problem. Except for the Seder night. The Seder night, you don't want to have egg matzah. You want to have real matzah. Okay, we've covered <laughs> a little bit of uh, chametz as well. Anybody have any questions about Pesach? Pesach is a big holiday. It's coming up soon. And the Zad Hashem, a couple weeks before then, we'll go over the halachot again, review what we need to know, uh, get into a little bit more about the various products, the various issues out there in the market, what to look out for, and how to, of course, prepare your kitchen, which is very important. But that we're going to be doing a little bit next week when we talk about Tebilat Kelim and Hagalat Kelim. Okay, there's no questions, so we'll continue next week, Zad Hashem.